Okay, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, uh, Professor Chris Foreman. I'm at the uh, Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville. Uh, yesterday I was at the cybersecurity session, so some of you were there and you saw me there, and if you didn't, you can look online and see some of the things that uh, we talked about in that session. Uh, so today I want to introduce uh, Oscar Morales. Uh, is this um, right here? He's a serial entrepreneur and angel investor uh, based in Indianapolis. Um, in 2009, he founded uh, Stepstone Angels, uh, now known as uh, Vision Tech Angels, and is the largest, most active angel investor group in Indiana, um, and one of the largest and most active in the Midwest, with almost 12 million invested into 29 companies. So. <coughs> He started his first company, BioStorage Technologies, in 2002. Uh, it was acquired in 2015 by publicly traded Brooks Automation for $127 million. Uh, Oscar's experience as founder of an angel and venture backup um, startup has enabled him to share his insights and knowledge with many entrepreneurs and investors over the last 10 years. So uh, he has an MBA from the University of Colorado, a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and his passion for entrepreneurism is only surpassed by his passion for his family and for traveling. Uh, so, great local resource for us to connect with. So, great. With that, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm happy to see some faces at nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not normally awake at this time on a weekend, so uh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, I guess the first, I, I want to say two things before I get started. One, I'm probably the least qualified person in this room to be here, so I feel really privileged to be here, and I, and I appreciate Katie and the invitation uh, from last, it's been uh, several months ago, I think from last spring, and, uh, and it's great to be here. And it's, the other thing I'll say is I did go out and look at those posters, and I didn't understand a one of them. So uh, perhaps I'll get some opportunity to spend some time and, and learn more about that. I'm looking forward to that. So um, pleasure to be here. Really like coming up and talking to groups about what I do. I'm very fortunate uh, in a number of different ways. I've uh, started and, and sold a, a successful company. And it's, you know, it's not very common that companies sell for nine figures. And, and uh, we were able to do that and had a great team around me that uh, enabled us to do that. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the other thing I'll say is I'm in a very unique position because I get to really interact with some super bright, brilliant people uh, with great ideas, um, great technologies that can really change the world. And uh, we're in a unique position uh, to be able to help them in different ways, not only providing capital, but also our network of resources that, uh, that has a pretty far reach. And we'll talk a little bit about what that network can do for folks uh, like yourselves. One last thing before I get started on my slide. The slide deck is going to be kind of boring. It's going to talk about angel investing. I'm going to give you some background on that, I'll tell you a little bit more about Vision Tech Angels, what we do. And then lastly, I'll tell you specifically about things that we look for in, in uh, companies and in founders. Um, but I'm curious, uh, by way of show of hands, how many of you have started a company? One, two, two people? Have you raised, how many of you have raised any capital outside of federally, you know, funded projects? Anybody? Contracts, industry contracts. Industry contracts? Okay, okay. Yeah, it's, and, and all three sources, I think, um, federal uh, uh, funding, uh, industry funding and ultimately private capital funding are very different uh, in terms of how you approach and what you have to think about. And uh, of course, I'll be talking about the private capital side and, and uh, hope, hopefully sharing some insight with you. So to get started, um, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, basically an angel investor overview. I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, again, what angel investing is and then uh, a little bit more about our group and then what we look for. So my background, as was described earlier, um, you know, goes back, I guess, 25 years or so now. Uh, my background's in life sciences. So I've been in life sciences since I was an undergrad, and that actually led me to the first company that I started, which was BioStorage Technologies back in 2002. Um, I came to Indiana in 2000 and um, worked for a company called Covance, which is in the life sciences. 
and did that for two years. And, and actually in that company, in my role in that company, I got this idea for BioStorage, which essentially is a company that provides uh, uh, management, cold chain logistics for pharma and biotech companies of all of their high value materials. So now we have facilities, we. The company that owns BioStorage now has facilities here in the US, in Europe, and uh, in Southeast Asia. So it's a pretty big company now. They actually have about 30, about close, close to 35 million samples under management, so worldwide. So. Uh, quite a large biorepository. Uh, I've been, since, uh, since I started my company, I guess I've, I can say that I've been an entrepreneur for the last 15 years or so, and it's been, uh, for me, it's been, it's been very rewarding in a number of different ways. I enjoy the, uh, doing what I do, and while it's pretty risky, uh, we do see some success, and that kind of keeps me coming back. It's kind of like gambling in Las Vegas. I think they let you win a little bit, just enough to get you back. Um, and I've invested in 29, all 29 companies that we have. Uh, I've been an investor in those as well. So uh, investing in these types of companies at, with this level of risk requires that you kind of put your, your, eggs in, or, yeah, your eggs in a lot of different nests. So um, um, it's, uh, it's very risky, but it's uh, potentially rewarding. So um, I'm going to kind of jump into describing what angel investing is, talking about the capital life cycle. And by all means, please ask questions during this. I want to make it as interactive as possible, and I think it'll be fun and, and engaging if we have that sort of discussion. So the life cycle for, uh, for individuals who want to come out and raise, or, or start a company, rather, is, is typical, uh, typically like this. Uh, so you start out kind of with this idea that you want to, that you want to start a business, you need to prove the concept. You need to do some things to validate your, your idea. And so you go out and, you know, if you're in a university setting, you can raise federal funds, uh, university funds, things of that nature. Uh, or the alternative uh, is may, perhaps if you're not in a university setting, you have to find capital sources from somewhere. So you go to your friends, your family, and what we call fools. Uh, those friends, family, and fools that invest in your idea at this stage are very, very likely going to lose all of their money. And so when you go out and you raise money from friends and family and fools, make sure that they're aware that the chances of success for you as an individual uh, and a company are, are very, very slim. And it's just the reality. So what happens is, say you raise some money, you start to prove your concept, your idea, you do some prototyping, you start to develop your product, uh, so on and so forth. Well, before you know it, your company is starting to grow. You need more capital, you need more people, you need a lot of other things to, to sustain that business and to keep that momentum going. So you'll find that you quickly run out of resources from friends, family, and fools. So the next source of capital is typically uh, in, this, in this area right here, pre-seed and, and seed startup stage, and that's where you go to folks like us, uh, angel investors who are, uh, in many cases, uh, successful business people. Uh, we're all accredited investors, and accredited investors are folks who meet certain minimum criteria through the Securities and Exchange Commission that allows them to um, invest in these high-risk potentially high reward uh, investments. So you have to have at least a million dollars of net worth, uh, not including the value of your home, of liquid net worth. And so there, there are financial criteria that make you an accredited investor. But trust me, they don't make you a sophisticated investor. I know people that have a lot of money that have no clue how to do this. And uh, they're considered sophisticated investors, though, just because they have a lot of money. And the idea is that if the, you lose all your money, which is something that we plan for when we invest in all of these companies, all 29 companies that I've invested, I've kind of uh, indicated that if I lost every single penny in all 29 companies, I can still survive. So that's kind of the idea behind angel investing. So you go out and you raise capital from angels and a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, first of all, you have outside investors. So your company is no longer your company. The whole dynamics of how you run the company, what you're thinking about, um, and then kind of the future strategy of the company and its growth is really dependent on the types of investors you bring on. But 
Uh, but you have to get into that mindset that it's no longer your company and you're not, no longer making you know, all of the decisions. And you can see as uh, you know, angel investors kind of get in, in involved in this stage of development, and then you can see as the company continues to progress and grow, it becomes more early stage, and then ultimately it starts to grow and scale. Uh, you know, this is where the commercial side of the business, you know, all the tech transfer that comes out of here, uh, for example, that has commercial opportunity, goes through this development stage, it goes through all the customer validation, then at some point you start to get customers, and then ultimately you hope you start to get customers that start to pay for your services or your product. And as that happens, the bigger you grow, the more capital you need. Again, the more people, the more product, so on and so forth. And so angel investors, believe it or not, do have a limit on the size of check that they're going to write. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But what happens then is you quickly outgrow or you do outgrow angel investors and you go into something more institutional uh, like venture capital. Uh, and again, that's high risk capital. And a lot of the reason why these companies are going through this process as opposed to what you might think about going to a bank, you know, the traditional lenders of, of capital, it, it just doesn't happen here. Um, you, you cannot get a loan for a startup business in most cases unless it's a bricks and mortar business and, and then you have a shot at it. But uh, uh, it's very, very difficult through the traditional banking methods to get capital. Um, and by and large, this is the process. There's 500,000 companies that start up every year in the U.S. alone, and of those 500,000, um, there's about 75,000, roughly, that get funded by angel investors. And of that 75,000, there's uh, even a smaller number. I think it's around 7,000 that get funded by venture capital. So it's a very small number. You can see how that filter goes down from 500,000 down to a relatively few companies that get venture-backed. But the venture capital money comes in, and it's usually uh, a big check. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But that helps the company really grow and scale and get to a point where ultimately it either gets acquired or um, it can go through an IPO or some uh, what's called a liquidation, what, some sort of an exit that returns the capital to investors along the way. So um, we're really pushing companies to, to get to that point where they exit through an IPO or get acquired because we want our money back at some point. And, and the sooner the better and the bigger the better, of course, right? So. Um, so that's kind of the life cycle, and uh, it's important to understand it. And as you start your company uh, and you start to think about how you're going to go through the funding stages for your company, um, think about these and kind of the ramifications associated with each. Any questions on that last slide? Okay. So there's a huge capital gap in Indiana and really across the country. Um, and, and so these are the different sources that we just kind of highlighted or touched on just a few minutes ago. Um, but the, the gaps are really pretty significant and uh, all across the board. So from friends and family, it's very difficult to get capital um, all the way through angel capital, venture, and then of course banking and private placement. What I will say though is if you have a great idea, a great market opportunity and a great team, money will find you. You'll find the, invested ca or the investment capital that you need. Uh, but you really have to have those three things. So this just kind of depicts a little bit about the size of the checks for each uh, stage of, of financing along that kind of that growth path. And you can see friends and family or the you know, small checks tend to maybe $250,000 if you're lucky, if you've got uh, a grandma somewhere who's you know, put away $250,000 under her mattress. Uh, maybe you can find that. Um, and then angels uh, and where we kind of play is in this 50,000 to maybe 500,000 or so uh, of capital. And then you can see on up the line as the company grows, needs more capital, so on and so forth, uh, the check size is uh, grow significantly. Venture capital checks are, are typically not even in that $2 million range. They're more like four to five, to four to five million dollars and up. Um, so they're investing significant capital. And then ultimately you do get to a point where it's funny because you get venture capital, and this happened with my company. You get venture capital, and we got, I think, about six, six and a half million. Uh, and then as soon as we got the check from the, from the venture capital firm, all these banks started coming to us and offering us money. So at that point, we didn't need bank money. We needed it right before the venture capital money because venture capital money is a lot more expensive than bank money. But uh, it's just, that's the way it goes. 
So, um, and then you can see as, you know, as uh, the needs to grow and scale the company continue to go, to go up, um, you get companies that are interested in acquiring you or you do an IPO to raise a lot of money. Uh, and actually one of our portfolio companies just did an IPO about two weeks ago, and that's pretty rare, but uh, we were really excited about that. And they raised $60 million um, in their IPO. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to differentiate venture capital from angel capital because a lot of times folks call me a venture capitalist and I'm really not. Um, first of all, I think VCs has, ha have a bad connotation associated with uh, you know, just the whole venture capital. And uh, I, we like to think that angel investors um, are very um, pleasant to work with. We provide a lot of things in terms of value add in addition to the capital, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so yeah, here are the numbers, uh, which are, I don't know, maybe you're not surprised, but I was shocked as, as far as how much capital uh, comes out of these two sectors for startups. About 25 billion from angels every year, uh, which is a lot of money into 71,000 deals. And then you can see the breakdown by stage of where they tend to invest. And you can see a lot of early stage investing uh, and then certainly less so as the companies, um, uh, you know, grow and, and, uh, and expand. And the interesting thing here, too, is right here at the bottom, um, that $25 billion comes from about 300,000 people. So it's not very many people that support that. And what's kind of sad about this is in the U.S., for example, there's 8 million qualified households. So qualified accredited investor households, there are 8 million in the U.S. that could contribute to this startup cycle, uh, but only 300,000 participate uh, on an annual basis. So it's a very small number of folks that kind of decide that they want to take the risk and do this. And the rewards, uh, you know, if you know what Google's worth, uh, what Apple's worth, what um, Amazon's worth, those are all angel-backed, venture-backed companies, and they made a lot of money for a lot of investors along the way. But it's, you know, they're very few, right? So unicorns are, are pretty small and pretty rare. Um, then on the flip side, you'll see venture capital who puts in about $60 billion uh, per year in capital. And that kind of fluctuates. Both of these numbers, actually angel investment capital is fairly steady year to year. Uh, venture capital, which is institutional capital, it comes from pensions and banks and, and other sources, is uh, a little bit more volatile. So it has uh, a little bit more uh, uh, peaks and valleys in terms of the amount of capital that's made available. For example, I think the year prior to, this is 2015, so 2014, I think these were actually pretty close to equal, about 25 billion or so uh, each. But VC money really bounced back in 2015, uh, as it has for the last couple of years. And so now you can see the breakdown as far as uh, the types of deals or how many deals they invest in and the stages of those deals. Any questions on this slide? Okay. Uh, just quickly, this is a map of the U.S. that basically shows the distribution of the deals by angel group in the U.S. Um, and just to highlight, everybody knows that, you know, a lot of stuff, a lot of deals get done out here in California and Silicon Valley. Um, Texas has a growing, very rich uh, uh, angel investment uh, community. And, uh, of course, you know, New England and New York have, have a large uh, share of the deal flow as well. But what you'll find surprisingly, and this continues to grow, is the, the Great Lakes area. That's where we're at. And um, it continues to grow. It's, and it's actually, uh, as of last year, I believe, the Great Lakes area is the second biggest uh, investment capital area uh, outside of Silicon Valley. So it now surpasses Texas, New York, New England, and uh, to, to a fairly large extent. Uh, so uh, it's good to see that capital is coming to the Midwest. Uh, but again, we've got we've to do the things that we need to do to kind of bolster and help startups along the way, whether they're technologies that are coming out of the uh, academic inst institutions um, or just an individual who decides he or she wants to start a company. Um, why do we do this? Why do angels get involved in this kind of stuff? I mean, it's so risky. You're going to lose your money on almost most of the deals. Um, but you'll see that you do make really, really high returns on a very small number. Um, so uh, our strategy is really kind of a portfolio strategy. As individuals, we try to invest in at least 20 companies. 
Um, and you can see kind of the distribution. Here, you're going to lose essentially all of your money, you know, 60, 55% of the time. It's actually a little bit higher than that um, because these are numbers from 2007, and those numbers have been updated. Uh, I didn't have a chart for it, but uh, it's probably 60, 65%. You're going to lose essentially all of your money. And on that remaining, you know, 35, maybe, maybe 40%, uh, you will get some return. And then on a very small number, maybe less than, certainly less than 10%, you're going to get this, you know, 30 times your money. And that return is going to recoup uh, all of your losses over here. So there is a strategy for it. Um, and we do try to stick to that. And there's methods and, and tactics that, that we can do along the way to uh, help mitigate that, that risk uh, as well. And certainly one of the things that we do is, as I mentioned a number of times already, is we don't just write the check for the entrepreneur. We also get very involved with the entrepreneurs and, and, uh, and there's a lot of different ways where we can do that. So I'm gonna change, did anybody have any questions on angel investing in general? Uh, anybody wanna be an angel investor? Okay, um, I'm going to change gears a little bit. Talk about uh, Vision Tech Angels. Uh, yes. Uh huh. Yes. I knew somebody. You guys are all engineers. Somebody had to have a question about a chart that I had up here. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, worth absolutely. And is that 2 or 10x worth your while? I mean, you get an estimate. Well, you can, you can see on average, and these numbers have changed a little bit. Our average holding period is three and a half years. Um, the overall multiple is just about two and a half times invested capital, which is about a 27% IRR, the, that's which, which is way higher than the markets. Twenty-seven percent annual growth every year uh, on your invested capital. All right. Does that make sense? That's the number. Okay. And now that's what we shoot for. You know, it 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 uh, it's all over the place. If you look at different angel groups across the country, it varies. Uh, but in general, actually, this is blended uh, data from all the angel groups uh, that reported in that year. So, yes. How many angel groups are there? There's over three hundred. There's probably closer to four hundred groups across the country now. Um, most of them are in that kind of the 20 to 30 or 40 range in terms of membership. Um, ours is, is large just because we've got um, a lot of different locations throughout the state. But uh, it's, it's been a trend over the, probably the last five years. Um, angel investing has kind of become trendy. Um, and so you have a lot of capital that's not very sophisticated coming to the market. And Folks are investing that, not knowing really, not having a strategy, not knowing what they're doing. They're going to lose all their money, and then, unless they're lucky, and then they're going to be out of it. So that's really unfortunate, and that's why we spend, as an angel group, we spend a lot of time educating our members about the risks and, and the strategies behind investing more appropriately. Yes? Um. So I don't know the specific number on, I don't have the specific number on that. Okay. We do our own internal, um, uh, based on our, our investments, so we can go back nine years and we've, we've created, I've, I've got a finance guy that has those types of answers. Sure. That's an answer that I can't give you just because I don't, I, I know we go, um, I believe for us, uh, one standard deviation is, is that the kind of thing that, yeah. that you're asking? So one standard deviation, I believe, gives us about a, I wanted to say about a four to six times return on our portfolio right now. Okay. And beyond that, I mean, it, on one end of the spectrum, it's really, really high. And then on the other end of the spectrum, it's pretty bad. So I mean, I think the reality is it's all speculation. Every company that presents to us and every investment that we make, these companies, these individuals, take a lot of time to put financial performance together, to put a business model together, to put a business plan together, and it never goes that way. I've never seen a business plan play out the way it was presented. Even the company that I started, 
uh, back in 2002, it was wildly different than uh, what we had expected. In some good ways, and then in some, you know, really not so good. So, okay. Good question. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Vision Tech is in Indiana. We um, are in multiple locations throughout the state, so we try to get good coverage throughout the state. We have actually a, a chapter here in Bloomington. It's a very small chapter, but it's growing, and we're excited to be here. Uh, and we're excited to be here because I use here. I mean, it makes a ton of, diff uh, of uh, there's a ton of interest in what's happening here. And we want to get more involved, and, and that's another reason why uh, Katie and I have been talking. And, and there's, there's opportunities, I think, for angel investors to get involved with the university, with tech transfer, uh, with faculty and students, and so on and so forth. So we're excited. We're trying to figure all that out. And... Um, and we think it'll be beneficial for everybody in the long term. Uh, we're all, and you can see the locations. Uh, we've got over 100 members. So if you think about it, every company that presents to us, literally every company that presents to us, somebody knows something about that technology or that individual or, which is great because if our collective mind share as a group enables us to kind of evaluate these things more deeply. Um, and there's something, a process called due diligence where we really go in and we, look at the technology, we look at the market, the competition, the intellectual property, the team, of course, and we evaluate a lot of those characteristics about that opportunity, and then once we get that information, do our research, compile that, put together a report, get it back to the investors, then we make a decision as to whether or not we want to participate in an investment, because we do participate collectively as investors, as opposed to individuals. Um, so we're all accredited investors. You can see kind of their backgrounds, um, which makes it a lot of fun for me because I get to really uh, interact with some very, very bright people that are very, very successful, and, uh, and it's fun. Uh, we're an ACA, Angel Capital Association certified group, so we're, we've gone through a rigorous process for uh, deal flow, uh, how to determine deal flow, to how to vet deal flow, so due diligence, the transaction side, which is the legal side, and the accounting side, we've gone through kind of a, uh, their process to, to get qualified as an angel group. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, and then we're pretty sector agnostic because of the group, because we can look at different types of deals in different sectors um, and in different stages. So, um, so I think we're pretty fortunate in that respect as well. Um, angel investing is pretty passionate, emotional investing usually, and we try to take a lot of that out as much as possible. But um, generally, angels, you'll, as a rule of thumb, will invest within about a five-hour radius or less. So as you think, as you go out and raise capital and you start thinking about who you need to talk to and why, um, there's a lot of things you need to think about, the types of groups, you know, have they invested in this sector, how much, what's been that experience, and, and there's a lot of things that you can do as individuals to vet the angel investors before you spend a lot of time with them. Because once you do take their money, um, it does become kind of like a marriage. I mean, you are connected in, in a lot of different ways and, and um, um, you know, you have to kind of be able to, to deal with that. So we've invested, I think we talked earlier, uh, $12 million to this day. We're actually closing two more deals by the end of the, this month. Um, so. Uh, the average size of our deals are somewhere in the two hundred to five hundred thousand dollar range initially, and then we do typically follow on investments. So, when companies don't meet their business plan, or things change, or they're growing faster, um, or they didn't meet their milestones, they come back to us and need more capital, and we'll evaluate whether it's worth investing again and under what terms. So we do reinvest in companies quite uh, quite frequently. Um, so uh, yeah, so two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. Our goal on every investment, when we kind of do a pro forma to map out what is this thing potentially going to do for us in terms, in, in, in terms of an economic return, we do shoot for, it's got to have, one of the hurdles it's got to have is at least 20 times return. So if we put a million dollars today, in five to seven years, we want to get, get back $20 million on that investment. And um, so it's got to be in a really big market, and it's got to have that sort of potential. Uh, otherwise, we kind of consider it more of a lifestyle business. And, and it's not going to be as attractive simply because of the risk. I mean, because if you think about it, we put a million dollars in 20 deals, you know, we're going to lose on six or seven of those. 
uh, or, or I'm sorry, uh, 12 or 15 of those. So, um, so it's very risky and, and the returns that we require to make up that loss is, are pretty significant. Yes? No, lifestyle like a like a barber shop or a restaurant okay. or you know something that's going to be a great living for somebody, but it's r from a scalability standpoint, it's not going to be you know a two hundred fifty two hundred fifty million dollar market or bigger essentially. Like something, like a, a business that someone would do for their job as sure. opposed to sure. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. You bet. Uh, and again, we talk about, uh, oh, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, we've put in about 12 million into these 29 companies, and they've gone on to raise another $200 million plus. Actually, it's closer to 300 million now that one of our companies did an IPO. Um, so they raised 60 million in that IPO. So that, to us, kind of validates some of the progress that they're doing, as well as some of the things that we um, invested in, the purposes that we invested in these companies, and the ways that we help them, um, which uh, we're excited about. Um, again, our, we talked about our portfolio strategy. Uh, to date, we've had six exits. Uh, an IPO, for example, is considered an exit. So unfortunately for us, because we came in so early, we're locked up for six months. So we can't, when the company went public, we can't do anything with our stock uh, until uh, a, that six month lockup period expires. And then we can sell it or whatever we want to do with it. We'll get our money at that point, And hopefully the company continues to uh, to grow and, and meet its uh, expectations on Wall Street, because if not, it gets crucified and who knows what happens, right? So um, that was the IPO. And then the other companies, we've uh, we had one that just went belly up. So we lost all of our money on one of the six deals. Um, and then you can see two returned some partial capital. So we didn't get quite all of our investment that we put in initially, but we got some of it back. And then three have returned higher than what we invested. Um, and we haven't had any like home runs, but uh, these are nice returns, and um, and you know they're, they're they certainly exceed the market what you would do in, in a traditional market, and we're pretty excited about that. So for those of you who are planning to raise capital from angels um, or this type of a, a kind of a more institutional or more sophisticated uh, model. I guess the first thing I'll say is you can see it, it takes a long time. So it, there, there isn't a week that goes by that we don't get approached by an entrepreneur or a company that says, we want to raise a million dollars, and today is, what is today, the 13th? The 11th. 11th, okay, the 11th, and they want to raise it by the end of November. So uh, that's just not going to happen. Um, and so plan accordingly, and we'll talk a little bit about what, what things you should be thinking about if you want to raise capital. But this is kind of our deal flow process, or our process uh, in general. So it starts with deal flow, and it's identifying opportunities. And, that's, and those opportunities stem out of things that I'm doing here, for example, um, referrals from other angel groups, people that just pop up on our website and unsolicited and, and submit an application. Uh, but we do see 400 plus applications per year. And uh, I have one executive director that's in charge of looking at all those applications, and we kind of work with them, and uh, we we kind of filter through those applications, and we, out of those 400, we're going to find 50 to 75 that are pretty interesting that we think might be good fits that kind of trigger the initial hurdles or, or at least uh, exceed the initial hurdles that we look at, and then of those 50 to 75, we'll pick 12 to 15 that are going to present to our angel network, because essentially. Uh, what they have to do, what these companies have to do, is they have to go on a road show. Uh, every, every other month, we have a road show. So every company that is selected will go, it's kind of like Shark Tank, right? Uh, so they go on a Shark Tank tour uh, to West Lafayette, to Indianapolis, to Fort Wayne, to Bloomington, and, um, and they'll present to our angels. And um, so it's a really, really fun experience. It's a great exercise for them because they get to practice their pitch multiple times during the course of a week. And then hopefully if they do a good job, uh, we'll basically write a check to them. Uh, but we have to get through a few other steps first. Uh, but uh, that's kind of the sequence for bringing companies in, getting them to pitch to our, to our groups. And you can see we, um, we have these meetings six times per year um, and then for those that we are interested in investing in after they pitch, 
we go through a pretty extensive due diligence process, which um, we bring our group, we might bring outside consultants, uh, but different resources to evaluate the, the deal, the opportunity, uh, the market, the com competition, technology, the team, a lot of aspects of the business that we look at to make sure that, and then of course the, the structure of the deal. So what are the terms of the deal and what are the economics for us potentially? So we look at a lot of aspects of that business before we uh, make a decision as to whether or not we're gonna write a check. Assuming we do write a check, so that takes another you know, one or two months. Um, and assuming we do write a check, we close the transaction, uh, which we get our lawyers involved and their lawyers involved and our accountants and, and um, we make the investment and then we do what's called portfolio management. So we write them a big check and then we sit on it, hopefully for not too long, but angel investing is very patient investing and typically uh, you'll see a seven to 10 year window if you get anything back at all. Uh, and one thing that angels have to be aware of that we kind of continue to beat into their heads is um, you can't, once you put the money in, you can't get it back at your, at, at your request. It's not going to come back. The only way it's going to come back is through an acquisition where there's more money that, that comes, or there's money that comes back to the company or an IPO perhaps. So there's got to be some process that happens for this company to get proceeds uh, such that they can distribute all those proceeds to, um, to investors. And we get approached by companies that, um, want us to invest and then they're gonna, they, they want to pay us a dividend over time so it'll be like a loan and we, we really don't get involved in that. We're not a bank, we don't wanna do that. We want equity, we want to share the upside for the risk that we're taking on uh, at that stage. And so that's a concept that I think a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs need to understand when they, when they come into this. So we manage these, these portfolio companies um, and that's the service that we provide to our angel group. Uh, because it's very time consuming, it's very rigorous, it's very constant. Things happen with these companies all the time. You can't, you can't imagine the, the stories that, you know, that we've experienced, uh, the things that we've experienced with our portfolio companies. Um, and I won't even go into that. that, that's like beer talk or something, I think. So, uh, but just uh, the takeaway from this slide is just you know, plan accordingly because it takes a long time. And that's for every group that you're dealing with. So if you start with our angel group today, you start with another angel group in a month, you know, typically you're gonna see something similar in terms of the time that's, that's expected in the process. So changing gears a little bit, we're gonna talk about kind of the, some of the things that we look for in companies and in entrepreneurs uh, to kind of trigger interest on our part. Uh, these are primarily economic things that trigger, uh, although the sector agnostic piece, again, you know, we're, we'll look at anything that has, uh, we'll look at any companies. We, we really want to support Indiana companies um, and Midwest companies, and because we do have a very large, diverse network of, of individuals, um, that does allow us to look at uh, almost any kind of deal. So we, we've even looked at real estate deals, for example. Um, so we're sector agnostic. The stage is typically, and again, this varies by angel group too. So some angel groups invest really, really early, um, kind of like in that friends and family stage that we saw in that chart prior. Uh, we don't. We like to see a little bit more traction, if you will, by the companies. So do they have a, a prototype of a product? Have they done any, what customer validation have they done? Do they have any customers? Have they done a a beta test or an alpha test, do they have some working model of what, what it is their product is, um, or if it's a service, you know, some sort of customer validation. Um, if there's a regulatory component, we like to see that they have um, gone down that regulatory path, uh, you know, with, to some extent so that it validates kind of the path that they're going on. Uh, if they're working, uh, especially if they're working with a, a consulting, an outside consultant regulatory body. Um, so, um, there's things that we, that we kind of try to have in place that help us validate that this is an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> the market size, again, it has to be a pretty big market. So the market generally has to be at least a quarter of a billion um, because most of these companies, if you think about you know, taking a one or two or three, 5% market share, maybe 10% market share, um, uh, you know, you, to, as you evolve your, or as you grow your company, 
that's kind of where you need to be in order to get acquired and, and, uh, and then have you know, significant returns uh, from, or the significant price tag on the acquisition um, that returns the capital to the investors. So it's gotta be a pretty big market. The pre-money valuation, so that, what that means is what is your company worth when you're getting investment from an, from an angel, or at any point when you're taking on invested capital and you're selling part of your company essentially for that money. Um, so for us, you know, the, the value of the company has to be certainly less than six million. Uh, we have done a couple of deals where we've exceeded that for kind of special purposes. But um, most of the deals for us at, at our stage are gonna be in that two to maybe $4 million valuation. Um, and then so if you think about it, if we write a half a million dollar check into a company that is valued at two million, you know, we're gonna get roughly 20% of the company, right? So um, that kind of working backwards from there, if we have 20% of the company, they're gonna raise more capital over time and we, we build in some assumptions about how much capital, when, and what that does to us in terms of dilution because every time the company goes out and raises more capital, our equity position in that company gets diluted. So um, if it starts out at 20% ownership and they go through two or three rounds, every round that we kind of assume, we're gonna get diluted by 25%. So when this company hopefully ultimately exits, sells or whatever, um, and the, the pie is worth $100,000 or $100 million, we you know own 5%, we get diluted down to 5%. So that's gonna be kind of the proceeds that come back to us. So we kind of, there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of modeling, and at the end, none of it really, I mean, it's gonna be wrong. It matters because it helps us kind of think through this, but it's gonna be wrong. Um, does that make sense? Okay. You guys are a lot smarter than I am, so it has to make sense. Uh, what's that? Yeah, right? Um, the size of the round needs to be less than two million usually. We don't, you know, because again, we're, our check is, you know, half a million dollars. Um, we don't want to be kind of a really, really small fish in a big investment round. So uh, if you think about the venture capital rounds that are, you know, potentially $50 million, and we came in with half a million dollars, you know, we don't have anything other than potential upside. So we don't have a say. We don't, we don't get to choose a board member to help the company. We don't get to bring the resources that we that we think we can bring to help that company be successful. So uh, we're pretty early on, we're a small kind of fish in a big pond, but we do make a difference and, and that's kind of what, another reason why we invest. Yes, Katie. For the 100 members you have in this um, Vision Tech Angel, what is the smallest amount that people put in uh, so far? And what's the largest amount and what's the median? Yeah, so, uh, so the question is, you know, what is the range of investment sizes from our angel groups, members? Um, I can tell you that we have, what's really exciting is also in, in terms of the diversity, what we don't have is enough women investors. And there are really a lot of qualified women investors. They just don't have, I think, a good uh, way to get on board with a group like ours. And, and it's kind of a visibility awareness thing. And our, our, our kind of, um, uh, women investors are starting to grow in, within our group, and, and what I find with women, and I'm getting off on a tangent here, but women investors do bring a really, really uh, wonderful perspective on how to evaluate these deals, and so um, we're really excited to have more and more women becoming more involved, not only as investors, but also as entrepreneurs. Um, women, statistically, by the way, have better success and higher returns on the companies that they start. So, um, so anyway, to get back to your question, the size of the check varies in our group anywhere between $5,000 per deal up to a million. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the outlier. Typically, the average investment by an individual in a deal for our group is around $26,000, $27,000. But then you would have to have 20 because that's what you're Yeah, exactly. Times yeah, yeah, yep. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and what, what that does kind of say is that we have folks that, have, that are accredited investors, who, but maybe they're just barely accredited, so they, their, their net worth is on the smaller end, um, and they do still have a strategy, so they write $5,000 checks you know, in 20 companies, so they're gonna invest $100,000 over some period of time. 
Um, but it is a strategy, and if it plays out, they could, you know, triple or quadruple that, that money over time or more. Um, and then we've got folks that are, you know, in the $100 million plus uh, net worth, and so they're going to write, you know, some pretty big checks. So. Yeah, so qualified again is, is you have a net worth of at least a million dollars, not including the value of your home, so it's liquid net worth. Um, or if you, if you don't have that net worth, but you make at least $200,000 a year, you have for the last three years, and you anticipate continuing to do that, uh, you can qualify. Uh, the thing is, it's pretty loose qualification, so it's kind of, and you self-accredit. So you complete a form to us, to Vision Tech, and this is for all the angel groups across the country. You say, hey, I'm worth at least a million, not including the value of my home, or I make at least 200,000 a year, and you check the box that's appropriate or boxes that are appropriate, you sign it, and we keep it on file. And if you lose all of your money, uh, and you come back and you try to sue us because you lost all your money, uh, we can say, well, you're an accredited investor, you understood the risk, and so on and so forth. Um, we do invest in primarily in preferred equity, so that means um, uh, that it's not founder equity. So when founders start a company, they say, Katie, you and I are going to start this company. You get 50%, I get 50%, and uh, we don't put any money into it, but we're going to do all our sweat equity. We're going to put all our time and effort into it, and then we start it. And then we go out and raise money from, like, real cash from investors. Maybe we put a little bit of money in or something like that, but ultimately, when we find angels and angels put in a half a million dollars, that's real capital and it's significant capital and it's different than founders capital because we've done, we've done a lot of work, but it's all sweat equity work and, and the capital piece is kind of valued at a higher, at a premium, so, or a, at a preference. So they have some preferences that say, okay, if you guys sell your company, if we sold our company, um, they would get their money back first with maybe some uh, upside and then only after they got all their money, if there's anything left, you and I can get some of that. So it's kind of unfair, but it's, if you think about the reason why, um, and the upside potential. I mean, if, if you make a lot of money on selling your company, there's gonna be plenty of money to share around the table. So, um, so it makes sense. Uh, and we do try to take 10 to 20% equity in these companies when we invest in them the first time, because, because again, you know, getting diluted over time, and what that does to our position. Uh, and then again, the potential for 20 to 30 times. So what do we look for in the companies? Um, you know, certainly the team is just critical. We, we always say that we'd rather invest in an A team with the B idea or a B product as opposed to an A product with a B team because invariably those teams are gonna fail. And it really always, always does come back to the team. Uh, and their ability to be creative, to be adaptive, to be, to execute on a plan, to work together uh, in a shared vision, and to bring and attract the right resources, talent. It's, I mean, it goes without saying, it, it's really kind of the secret sauce that makes these things work. Um, and, you know, some of the other things are getting help early and kind of networking, understanding who, uh, who you are as a company, what your culture is, where you have gaps, where you need help, and finding that help early on, not being too proud to say, hey, I don't know the answer um, in this area, please come help me. Um, and then getting your investors on, uh, on board and involved in your company. Uh, so many times entrepreneurs just want the check and they think they can do it all on their own, and, and the reality is that happens very, very rarely. And uh, you'll, even the, the, the most successful companies out there, you'll see that they've surrounded themselves with really, really strong investors, board members, advisors along the way, and that's really helped them. Um, we look for teams that have demonstrated good planning and execution along the way. So that could be a lot of the early stuff that happens before we get interested and ultimately before we uh, invest. And so document a lot of that stuff that you're doing along the way that will help you validate or, or demonstrate kind of the things that you've done. Uh, it's all about having a relationship with an investor and um, establishing that credibility with that investor and, um, and, and really kind of uh, gaining their confidence in your abilities to, uh, to build this company and to manage it and execute on it. 
Um, communication <clears throat> is just absolutely critical at all points of uh, business development. Um, and, and I think, you know, one thing that I would emphasize is, is it's always great to hear the, great, the good news and the great news, um, but more so, especially at these early stages, so many of these companies struggle with so many different things. And um, so bad news or where if you're not headed in the direction that you had anticipated, get, you know, your resources, your network involved as early as possible. So good communication, relevant communication, timely communication is critical. Um, and in many cases can help turn things around. <clears throat> and then lastly, you know, cash is king. Um, well, not lastly, there's one other one. But cash is king. I mean, this is somebody else's money. So be a good steward of that money. Um, and, you know, investors nowadays are a lot more savvy about if they invest, they, you have to kind of say how you're going to use these funds. And you have to, you know, and they check financials periodically, regularly, so that they can see on an income statement, yeah, I'm spending, uh, all, you know, all of a sudden my salaries went way up, way out of line. Or they can see that you're, you know, you're doing what you said you're going to do. You're going to spend a lot more on marketing and maybe some software development. And they can see in the, in the P&L or on the income statement that you are spending in those areas. So it's, it's a little bit easier to manage uh, and to kind of keep an eye on it. But I think from a kind of a responsibility standpoint, just having that mindset is, is really important. And then the last thing is, you know, just validating the market. We see so many technologies, especially out of the university settings. They're great technologies. This is fun stuff, really cool stuff, exciting stuff. And we get really excited about it until we start to think, so what's the market for this? And we kind of joke around, and I don't know what within your walls what you guys talk about, but you know, we, we always think that universities develop really cool technologies with no market in mind. It's just, you have a fun lab, you're getting all this federal funding and you're doing all these really cool things, but there's no market in mind. And, and maybe for some projects that makes sense, but for the projects that we wanna fund, we wanna make sure that there's a clear market identified, uh, at least an initial market identified, and that you've done some work in that and you've done some validation on that. So um, uh, keep that in mind as well. Um, fundraising, it's very time consuming, plan in advance. Yes, sir. Question to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. um, ICOR, NSF, does that help in this process? Do you have you found it to be useful or not really? I wish I could tell you that I, I know about this much about ICOR, um, simply because the universities haven't we haven't engaged in a way that I think is productive enough. Um, we tried in one case to engage with a professor from Purdue on an I-Corps program that she had been involved in. It just didn't work out for whatever reason, but I never really kind of learned exactly what that process was like. We would love for the universities to come to us and say, we've got these I-Corps applicants or these I-Corps projects. You know, how can you guys help? How can we work together? Um, so, I mean, that's the extent of our I-Corps experience. I, I think to the extent that we can get more involved with faculty, you know, students, at these early stages um, helps us so much in terms of understanding kind of what you're going through and then at what point it makes sense to kind of throw it over the fence, if you will, and, and start to work on private commercialization or whatever that path happens to be. So my point was i -Corp tries to beat that home, right? To, to be prepared, to know what the market mm -hmm. is, to give you a market segment. What are you adding to the market? Mm -hmm. My question was, what was your experience then as a consumer of that i -Corp product? So we we actually have not seen right. a company so that's been through that, right, okay. that's come to us for funding officially. Uh, let's see, I think that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's really, you know, um, Know your audience, know your business. You guys are the, the, the technology experts the, that know the science behind it, the technology, um, and hopefully some, some ideas about the market. 
And then I think what I will say, is two things, is manage the process. Once you start to raise capital, you absolutely have to be the manager for that process. You can't rely on investors to come back to you and, and you know, ask for more information, ask for more information. You have to feed and you have to kind of have a managed process along the way because otherwise investors get bored really quickly and very easily and another deal comes through and they like that all of a sudden. It's all, it's, you know, it's all the sparkle that's on these deals and, and they're easily distracted. So you have to manage that process from start to finish and we don't see that enough. And then lastly, again, I mentioned this earlier, capital is available. People talk about there's a lack of capital but I will argue that there is capital for good deals with good teams and good opportunities. So I think with that, uh, I'm done. So thank you. That might be a, a really stupid question, but um you know, there's no such thing as yeah. a stupid question, right? So you guys invest in, in companies, but where does your money come from? Uh, as Vision Tech, that's yeah, a great question. As Vision that's Tech. a great question. That's a super question. That's probably the best question we've been asked in a long time. Nobody thinks about that. Well, as individual investors, so I do participate in these on a, pri on a personal basis. So I invest in uh, most of these companies. As a business, and it's so key, because when I was raising capital from angel investors, on my first company, I found pockets of individual angels here and there. There was no sustainability. There was no group that was sustainable. So, the, we set, so I set this up as a business, a for-profit business. So the way we make money is our investors, say we put a million dollars into a deal. Say we put $100,000 into a deal. We get back a million dollars you know, in five years. So the investors get their money back first. So they get their $100,000 back. That's the hurdle. There's $900,000 left in profit. Vision Tech gets 20% of that profit, and then the other gets distributed amongst those investors that participated uh, on a pro rata, how much they invested, how much they own of that entity that we formed for that. So we get, it's a kind of a traditional venture capital model where investors always get their money back first, and then what remains is profit on a deal-by-deal -deal basis. Um, what remains is profit, and then we get a percentage of that profit. So, sure, good question. Uh, I always assume that uh, university tech transfers uh, actually know where the angel investors are and they would be in contact with you, but I'm gathering that's not happening. Um, the second one is since I went to the NIH, I actually set up a, a sort of NIH venture program where we help people get ready for angel investors and so forth, but I don't know if there is any way of really collaborating, are there channels of communication? If I didn't come here, I didn't know you existed, you know, s sure. stuff like that. I mean, how do we connect the dots? I mean, we are all trying to help various stages, but I don't think we are connected. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, for us, there, there's an outreach component. We're trying to create awareness, not only to investors in the investment community, but also to the entrepreneurs. And so one of the things that, you know, for example, I've been doing is I speak at various, at the universities around here, at IU, Purdue, Butler, uh, Ball State, um, and just to create that awareness to entrepreneurs. And usually it's to business, to the business students. It's not typically to, uh, you know, the, the technology students, engineering. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe that's an area where we need to rethink about who we present to and who, where we're creating this awareness. I can tell you that Purdue, you know, um, they have a pretty progressive innovation program, internal innovation program. And so we do, with Purdue, work with the Foundry, uh, which is kind of their, their entrepreneurial innovation group. And they do kind of channel us out into their organization, into their uh, institution to kind of create that awareness. Um, so we, we do get approached by Purdue uh, companies or faculty. No, I mean, that's, and, but these are the things that we're doing to begin that process. I mean, and, and Purdue, you know, is, is progressive, but they're, they're also evolving as well and they're learning. So. Mm. Last quick question, hopefully quick question. Do you use any data science approaches to actually uh, look at papers, <coughs> patents, grants, clinical trials, other large-scale data sets to understand what 
is funded by NIH, NSF, and others because something is going to happen there if they put a lot of money behind. But then also you might see emerging areas, you might see uh, which companies are selling very nicely, etc. Mm -hmm. So you do you use this kind of large-scale, ideally global data to inform your decision-making? No. We, we should. I know. No, that makes perfect sense. And I got, I got a little bit of that insight yesterday dur during our conversation. Um, and I, I was thinking that's maybe a great opportunity for us to kind of get more informed or better informed. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> okay, great. Wonderful. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you.